Tutorial 16, Aeromedical Factors. It is important for a pilot to be aware of the mental and physical standards required for the type of flying done. This lesson provides information on medical certification and on a variety of aeromedical factors related to flight activities. Most pilots must have a valid medical certificate to exercise the privileges of their airman certificates. Glider and free balloon pilots are not required to hold a medical certificate. Sport pilots may hold either a medical certificate or a valid state driver's license. Acquisition of a medical certificate requires an examination by an Aviation Medical Examiner, AME, a physician with training in aviation medicine designated by the Civil Aerospace Medical Institute, CAMI. There are three classes of medical certificates. The class of certificate needed depends on the type of flying the pilot plans to do. A third class medical certificate is required for a private or recreational pilot certificate. It is valid for five years for those individuals who have not reached the age of 40. Otherwise, it is valid for two years. A commercial pilot certificate requires at least a second class medical certificate, which is valid for one year. First-class medical certificates are required for airline transport pilots and are valid for six months. The standards are more rigorous for the higher classes of certificates. A pilot with a higher class medical certificate has met the requirements for the lower classes as well. Since the required medical class applies only when exercising the privileges of the pilot certificate for which it is required, a first-class medical certificate would be valid for one year if exercising the privileges of a commercial certificate and two or three years as appropriate for exercising the privileges of a private or recreational certificate. The same applies for a second-class medical certificate. The standards for medical certification are contained in Title 14 of the Code of Federal Regulations, 14 CFR Part 67, and the requirements for obtaining medical certificates can be found in 14 CFR Part 61. Students who have physical limitations, such as impaired vision, loss of a limb, or hearing impairment, may be issued a medical certificate valid for student pilot privileges only while learning to fly. Pilots with disabilities may require special equipment installed in the aircraft, such as hand controls for pilots with paraplegia. Some disabilities necessitate a limitation on the individual's certificate. For example, impaired hearing would require the limitation not valid for flight requiring the use of radio. When all the knowledge, experience, and proficiency requirements have been met and a student can demonstrate the ability to operate the aircraft with the normal level of safety, a statement of demonstrated ability can be issued. This waiver, or SODA, is valid as long as the physical impairment does not worsen. A number of health factors and physiological effects can be linked to flying. Some are minor, while others are important enough to require special attention to ensure safety of flight. In some cases, physiological factors can lead to in-flight emergencies. Some important medical factors that a pilot should be aware of include hypoxia, hyperventilation, middle ear and sinus problems, spatial disorientation, motion sickness, carbon monoxide, CO poisoning, stress and fatigue, dehydration, and heat stroke. Other subjects include the effects of alcohol and drugs, anxiety, and excess nitrogen in the blood after scuba diving. Hypoxia means reduced oxygen or not enough oxygen. Although any tissue will die if deprived of oxygen long enough, usually the most concern is with getting enough oxygen to the brain since it is particularly vulnerable to oxygen deprivation. Any reduction in mental function while flying can result in life-threatening errors. Hypoxia can be caused by several factors, including an insufficient supply of oxygen, inadequate transportation of oxygen, or the inability of the body tissues to use oxygen. High-altitude flying can place a pilot in danger of becoming hypoxic. Oxygen starvation causes the brain and other vital organs to become impaired. 
One noteworthy attribute of the onset of hypoxia is that the first symptoms are euphoria and a carefree feeling. With increased oxygen starvation, the extremities become less responsive and flying becomes less coordinated. The symptoms of hypoxia vary with the individual, but common symptoms include cyanosis, blue fingernails and lips, headache, decreased reaction time, impaired judgment, euphoria, visual impairment, drowsiness, lightheaded or dizzy sensation, tingling in fingers and toes, numbness. As hypoxia worsens, the field of vision begins to narrow and instrument interpretation can become difficult. Even with all these symptoms, the effects of hypoxia can cause a pilot to have a false sense of security and be deceived into believing everything is normal. The treatment for hypoxia includes flying at lower altitudes and or using supplemental oxygen. All pilots are susceptible to the effects of oxygen starvation, regardless of physical endurance or acclimatization. When flying at high altitudes, it is paramount that oxygen be used to avoid the effects of hypoxia. The term time of useful consciousness describes the maximum time the pilot has to make rational, life-saving decisions and carry them out at a given altitude without supplemental oxygen. As altitude increases above 10,000 feet, the symptoms of hypoxia increase in severity and the time of useful consciousness rapidly decreases. Hyperventilation is the excessive rate and depth of respiration leading to abnormal loss of carbon dioxide from the blood. This condition occurs more often among pilots than is generally recognized. It seldom incapacitates completely, but it causes disturbing symptoms that can alarm the uninformed pilot. In such cases, increased breathing rate and anxiety further aggravate the problem. Hyperventilation can lead to unconsciousness due to the respiratory system's overriding mechanism to regain control of breathing. Pilots encountering an unexpected stressful situation may subconsciously increase their breathing rate. If flying at higher altitudes, either with or without oxygen, a pilot may have a tendency to breathe more rapidly than normal, which often leads to hyperventilation. Since many of the symptoms of hyperventilation are similar to those of hypoxia, it is important to correctly diagnose and treat the proper condition. If using supplemental oxygen, check the equipment and flow rate to ensure the symptoms are not hypoxia-related. Common symptoms of hyperventilation include visual impairment, unconsciousness, lightheaded or dizzy sensation, tingling sensations, hot and cold sensations, muscle spasms. The treatment for hyperventilation involves restoring the proper carbon dioxide level in the body. Breathing normally is both the best prevention and the best cure for hyperventilation. In addition to slowing the breathing rate, breathing into a paper bag or talking aloud helps to overcome hyperventilation. Recovery is usually rapid once the breathing rate is returned to normal. Middle ear and sinus problems. During climbs and descents, the free gas formerly present in various body cavities expands due to a difference between the pressure of the air outside the body and that of the air inside the body. If the escape of the expanded gas is impeded, pressure builds up within the cavity and pain is experienced. Trapped gas expansion accounts for ear pain and sinus pain, as well as a temporary reduction in the ability to hear. The middle ear is a small cavity located in the bone of the skull. It is closed off from the external ear canal by the eardrum. Normally, pressure differences between the middle ear and the outside world are equalized by a tube leading from inside each ear to the back of the throat on each side, called the eustachian tube. These tubes are usually closed, but open during chewing, yawning, or swallowing to equalize pressure. Even a slight difference between external pressure and middle ear pressure can cause discomfort. In a similar way, air pressure in the sinuses equalizes with the pressure in the flight deck, 
through small openings that connect the sinuses to the nasal passages. An upper respiratory infection, such as a cold or sinusitis, or a nasal allergic condition, can produce enough congestion around an opening to slow equalization. As the difference in pressure between the sinuses and the flight deck increases, congestion may plug the opening. This sinus block occurs most frequently during descent. Slow descent rates can reduce the associated pain. Spatial disorientation specifically refers to the lack of orientation with regard to the position, attitude, or movement of the airplane in space. The body uses three integrated systems working together to a certain orientation and movement in space. Vestibular system, organs found in the inner ear that sense position by the way we are balanced. Somatosensory system, nerves in the skin, muscles, and joints which, along with hearing, sense position based on gravity, feeling, and sound. Visual system, eyes, which sense position based on what is seen. All this information comes together in the brain and, most of the time, the three streams of information agree, giving a clear idea of where and how the body is moving. Flying can sometimes cause these systems to supply conflicting information to the brain, which can lead to disorientation. During flight in visual meteorological conditions, the eyes are the major orientation source and usually prevail over false sensations from other sensory systems. When these visual cues are removed, as they are in instrument meteorological conditions, False sensations can cause a pilot to quickly become disoriented. Vestibular illusions. A condition called the leans can result when a banked attitude, to the left for example, may be entered too slowly to set in motion the fluid in the roll semicircular tubes. An abrupt correction of this attitude sets the fluid in motion, creating the illusion of a banked attitude to the right. The disoriented pilot may make the error of rolling the aircraft into the original left-banked attitude, or, if level flight is maintained, will feel compelled to lean in the perceived vertical plane until this illusion subsides. Coriolis illusion. The Coriolis illusion occurs when a pilot has been in a turn long enough for the fluid in the ear canal to move at the same speed as the canal. A movement of the head in a different plane, such as looking at something in a different part of the flight deck, may set the fluid moving and create the illusion of turning or accelerating on an entirely different axis. This action causes the pilot to think the aircraft is doing a maneuver that it is not. The disoriented pilot may maneuver the aircraft into a dangerous attitude in an attempt to correct the aircraft's perceived attitude. For this reason, it is important that pilots develop an instrument cross-check or scan that involves minimal head movement. Take care when retrieving charts and other objects in the flight deck. If something is dropped, retrieve it with minimal head movement and be alert for the Coriolis illusion. Visual illusions. Visual illusions are especially hazardous because pilots rely on their eyes for correct information. Two illusions that lead to spatial disorientation, false horizon and autokinesis, are concerned with only the visual system. False horizon, a sloping cloud formation, an obscured horizon, and aurora borealis, a dark scene spread with ground lights and stars, and certain geometric patterns of ground lights can provide inaccurate visual information, or false horizon, for aligning the aircraft correctly with the actual horizon. The disoriented pilot may place the aircraft in a dangerous attitude. Autokinesis. In the dark, a stationary light will appear to move about when stared at for many seconds. The disoriented pilot could lose control of the aircraft in attempting to align it with the false movements of this light, called autokinesis. Postural considerations. The postural system sends signals from the skin, joints, and muscles to the brain that are interpreted in relation to the Earth's gravitational pull. These signals determine posture. 
Inputs from each movement update the body's position to the brain on a constant basis. Seat of the pants flying is largely dependent upon these signals. Used in conjunction with visual and vestibular clues, these sensations can be fairly reliable. However, because of the forces acting upon the body in certain flight situations, many false sensations can occur due to acceleration forces overpowering gravity. These situations include uncoordinated turns, climbing turns, and turbulence. We hope you learned a lot. Please help us spread the word about Pilot Training System, and we look forward to further servicing your flight training needs.